with no further ado, would you please welcome Johnny Nadelman. Oh my goodness, I hope I have something to say. Okay, uh, okay. Um, hi. Um, okay, where do I want to start? I want to start um, because I, want, I need to talk about community. Uh, I, Paul said something to me the other day that uh, I've been saying for 10 years, and that is that uh, I thought I knew what community was. I lived, in, I lived in Venice before that, and Venice smells like a community. But uh, I, uh, last year, I was, uh, I was putting, in fact, right about this time last year, I was putting a, a, a ceiling fan in my daughter's bedroom. And I needed a stud finder. I had to find somebody to do it. Um, no, that's not it. Everyone in this town knows what a stud finder is, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, from my Palisades friends, we'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, I realized, it dawned on me, that I had 17 people in my neighborhood that I could call to borrow a stud fund. I'm not great at reaching out. So the idea that I was literally able to comfortably reach out to 17 people in my neighborhood hit me pretty hard. And uh, the interesting thing was before I got to the fourth person, the third person who's in this room, I just saw him walk in, Chris. Chris had already called two of his friends to find out if he could find a stud finder because he couldn't find his. And I realized that that's, uh, in, a, in, a, in an essence, what a community provides. That community is uh, a vehicle, uh, it is a vessel, it is a resource, and it is a, it is a responsibility. And that responsibility uh, can be weighty. You know, borrowing the stud finder also means that I'm going to get called to help a friend move. And I've watched what that means for me as a man and that I have been able to root and ground in a way that I have never been rooted and grounded before. And so part of this is an offering back to that. Um, I also went to Cali Camp as a little boy. <laughs> um, we'll, we may or not, may not talk about that later. Uh, but what I do want to talk about in terms of community is that uh, for hundreds, hey, Sean, and and. And hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of years, um, it was understood by community that there is a, a noble responsibility in attending to and initiating their youth. And so I put it out there to you, let us, let us put our hearts and minds together and see what kind of lives we can make for our kids. Uh, I have a question for all of you. How many of you are parents? Wow. How many of you are teachers? All right, that was a trick question. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you again later. All right, let's set that out there. For centuries, as I said, um, communities, in fact, this community, right, the Tongva Indians lived in these hills for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, if you ask Paul, maybe longer. Right, he's the anthropologist. Uh, and the interesting thing is that not only on this continent, but on the other six continents as well, the uh, communities listen deeply to the, craving of their, the cravings of their young. And somehow, uh, without Wi-Fi or, inter or internet, they independently arrived at a fundamental requirement for the survival and the future of the tribe depends upon the initiation of their young. And that these initiatory ceremonies and rites of passage were established in part to challenge, to uh, awaken, and to terrify the youth into understanding the cosmology of who they are in their fear. And being able to, in that manner, reveal and awaken their gifts, their value, and their responsibility to the community. Mm. Yummy. Yeah. yeah. Um, hmm. So what would happen is that, very typically, the women of the tribe would begin to notice 
the behavior of the boys changing, and they would make it known to the mentors and the elders of the tribe. And the men would come into the home and rip the boys out of the arms of their mothers and send them on a quest. Now these elders and these mentors knew these boys quite intimately. And so the particular challenge that was required of the boy was very akin to and very specific to what his gifts and his weaknesses were. And he would be sent off. And until he completed this challenge, he was not welcomed back into the tribe. And upon his return, he would be intercepted by one of the men and taken to a sacred site. And there would be a, a ceremonial fire. So let's say, for example, I was a member of the Kikuya tribe, which is an African tribe. That newly welcomed man would come back into the circle. And before he would be brought into the village, he would be brought into a circle of men, all of the adult men in the tribe who, have, who had similarly been initiated. And he would sit, if his grandfather was still alive, to his left, and his father to his right, and all the men would sit in circle with him. There's a particular component that was very similar in this welcoming, and it was the sharing all of the collective wisdom, wisdom of all of those who had come before. And so in this particular circle, all of the men would sit around, and each man would take a turn and share a part of the tribe's history. Perhaps a grandfather might tell of the boy's birth story. And another man might tell the origin story of the tribe or the tribe's spiritual beliefs, perhaps their sacred songs or their texts, not these texts, <laughs> right? Um, the language and the laws of the community that he would now have to abide by and the science and the mathematics of this community. Now, some of you might begin to realize where this once sacred ritual and the remnants of it have been moved to, and that's education. Now, historically, the student-teacher relationship, not unlike the elder-initiate relationship, was considered quite sacred and dominated by uh, intimacy and discourse and... Uh, collaboration, and longevity, and even love. Well, very recently, that particular ritual, our educational ritual, uh, ritual, has become a civic responsibility, and oftentimes um, overburdened by uh, standardized metrics, and overcrowded and somewhat uh, impersonal and dispassionate and dominated by memorization and regurgitation and competition and at most about nine months long until the next teacher and the next teacher and the next teacher. And as my teenagers would say, where's the love? So I'm going to try something with all of you. Let's see if this can work. I'm going to ask all of you to close your eyes. And I want you to think back to when you were in junior high or high school. And I want to see if you can remember the best looking or most popular boy or girl in your junior high and high school class. Your favorite song. Your best friend. The thing you were best at or most proud of. The first time you drove your car really fast and your first car accident. Your first fight. Your first roller coaster ride. The first time you fell for someone. You picture their hair and their eyes, <coughs> their body. Your first slow dance. You remember the song? Remember where you were? The first time you played Truth or Dare? The first time you made out? The thing about you that you were the most self-conscious, embarrassed, or ashamed of? Keep your eyes closed and raise your hand if you remember most of these moments.
Open your eyes. For, keep your hands up for a second. Open your eyes. Look around the room. All right. Now, from this emotional adolescent place, riddle me this. What is the circumference of a 14-inch pizza? <laughs> or what is the purpose of a quadratic equation? Who's the third president? <laughs> Does anybody here speak the language, that they, the foreign language that they studied in high school? No. All right. Anybody know more than one of those besides you? <laughs> no one. Wow. We spent a lot of time on quadratic equations, guys. All right. As most of you locals know, everything speaks. These mountains, these oak trees, and these sycamore trees, all right, the creek, they all speak. And if we listen, and we don't have to listen that hard, our children are speaking quite loudly. 272 school shootings since Sandy Hook, 72 of them fatal. Cyberbullying, ADHD, medicated with stimulants, teen on teen violence a teenage suicide rate that is three times what it was in 1970. They are screaming out, maybe it's time for another educational paradigm. You know, we think about uh, childhood. Childhood has this exquisite sequential developmental stages that we move through, right? Our, at, uh, at a year and four months, you can take your little baby, and I used to do this, and put her in front of a mirror with a little sticker on her head, and she'll move to the baby with the sticker on her head, and she'll want to play with that little sticker. And then at a year and six months, almost to the day, certainly to the week, they will go, oh, that's me. And they will never touch that mirror again. That's called self-awareness. Right, it happens at a year and a half. At about three, another exquisitely sequential developmental milestone. This was Piaget, by the way. Us shrinks love to do this kind of stuff. Um, and the developmental milestone I'm supposed to say no, sorry, is called uh, beginnings and endings. Now, I teach human development. So the question you get from your three-year-old is, where did I come from? Right, again, big day, brain development, brain growth. Four, the question is, I came from your belly. How did I get in? Oh, how did I get out of there? Right? Five, causation. That's a big one because now we get to send our kids to school because they understand uh, cause and effect. Right? You take Johnny's toy, that's why he's crying. Right? Cause and effect. Right? Responsibility. Again, that's why we get to send our kids to school. We send them earlier, but that's a whole other thing. The question you get in terms of human development, oh, I was in your belly. How did I get in there in the first place? Now, there's a whole thing about latency, you know, and, and uh, Freud invented latency, but I'm pretty sure Freud didn't live in L.A. with, uh, with Beyonce on the, on the side of the bus naked, right, half naked. Um, the 24-hour bad news cycle and the sexualized uh, marketing to our kids. But uh, by nine the critical thinking skills start to develop, right? The Waldorfians call it uh, the nine-year change, right? And all of a sudden, there's a litany of other cognitive abilities. Uh, critical thinking, inference, uh, deductive reasoning, introspection, and self-examination. The kernel, and only the kernel, of morality. Now, again, big day. By 10, we are no longer the informational gatekeepers for our kids. You know, I typically make the joke, you go into the grocery store, and there it is on the, on the, uh, the Vogue or Cosmopolitan magazine, you know, the 10 ways to please your man. Every one of us is laughing. The 10-year-old is laughing because she knows that's about sex. The adults are laughing because there's really only three ways to please a man, but that's something else. <laughs> so now comes 12 or 13. And as they are prone to say, all bets are off. 
because this beautiful sequential developmental stuff is over. And as it's been said, adolescence, uh, childhood is about growth. Adolescence is about radical change. Bodies, feelings, relationships, social and school rules, all spin on their heads. The way I've heard it put well is uh, for the first nine years, if we're lucky, 10 years, our kids look at us and they think, you do everything for me. You feed me, you clothe me, you shelter me, you educate me. You must be gods. Well, 11 or 12, sometimes 10, and they look at the exact same information. Look what you do for me. Everything, you take me anywhere I want to go. You're the sacrifices you make. I must be a god. <laughs> and now we're in trouble. Huh? Or nine and a half. So uh, I'm driving over to my friend's house with my lovely daughter, and we pass by the billboard for, thank you, Cameron Diaz and Jason Siegel, for the new movie, Sex Tape. Right, which is tape that you use on your body so you can have sex, according to my nine-year-old daughter. And I'm thinking, where can I get some of this? So, sorry, Rube. All right. Ah, la, 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 la. Oh, I'm only there? Good God. Okay. Uh, all right. So now, right? Um, right, 11 and 12, we're talking about the, the big stuff, um, adolescence and what it means. Well, for many, many, many centuries, it was all oh, these hormones, they make our kids so intolerable, and how are we going to do this? We're going to have to increase the wine consumption so we can suffer through. <laughs> no. It is the crucible of our future that we invest right here. And it is not linear, right? Radical change. Again, everything suggests it. Now there's all kinds of really interesting brain technology, which I understand a little bit of, but thanks to Dan Siegel, Dr. Dan Siegel, he's translated a lot of it for us. Uh, parenting from within, right? parenting from within and brainstorm. Uh, the, the subtitle is The Purpose and Power of the Adolescent Brain. This guy is genius because he's also got our language for the rest of us so we can understand what that means. Um, here's what I know about it. What happens is no longer brain maturation, but complete brain reformation. Uh, what it looks like on a scan is that gray matter and white matter, one begins to shrink as the other one begins to grow quite dramatically. Uh, neuroscientists call it pruning, and it's exactly what it sounds like. When you have a rose bush and you know, springtime looks gorgeous, wintertime we hack the heck out of it so that we can form more new, new uh, neural pathways. So again, what that means for us in terms of learning is that there are four very essential qualities of learning that take over. If you take nothing from this evening's discourse, these are the things that you're going to want to know because it will, one, allow you to have a little bit of compassion for what your child is going through, maybe a little compassion for what you're going through, but of equal importance, how to show up and really parent an adolescent. And it looks like this. Novelty seeking, right? New experience, right? In order to form new neural pathways, we have to have new experience and primary experience. Not sitting on our asses being told anything, but to be in a tangible relationship, a visceral relationship with experience, right? That's what grows those neural pathways, right? Um, how could, okay, so what happens is that, uh, well, research suggests, and lots of research suggests, that, the, that one of the ways this shows up again on a brain scan is that the average adult has a particular level of dopamine in their body, right? Dopamine is a neurotransmitter and a mood elevator. An adolescent brain has a significant lower, a significantly lower amount of dopamine in their brain. Guess what makes dopamine? Novelty new experience, risk-taking behavior. You know what else does? Drugs and processed food. Yeah, that's what I said. So again, to, to really take a look at, oh, 
No wonder. Again, all of this predates puberty, typically by at least two years. So nothing to do with hormones. In fact, the risk-taking behavior isn't even about impulsivity. Uh, the way that I've heard it described is uh, he uses this example of Russian roulette. And if I give you a million dollars to play Russian roulette with me, the average adult says, no, I'm good. But an adolescent will use what he calls hyper-rational thinking, which is fact-based uh, reasoning. And he'll look at, OK, well, there's six chambers. There's one bullet in the chamber. Five out of six times, I'm going to win a million dollars. Let's play. Right? Now, here's the dilemma, is that the adolescent brain, again, given the inverted amount of, of gray matter to right matter, focuses on positive experience. Winning a million dollars. Glory, peer recognition are very, very high on the scale. What is not high on the scale is what he calls positive values. Positive values would be uh, staying alive is a pretty positive value, right? Um, being healthy, having a future, right? All positive values. There is no direct pathway to see that as valuable. Here's where it comes from. Intuition, right? Self-reflection. Being able to sit with one's emotional states. That's going to show up later, by the way. That's just one, novelty seeking, right? Number two, uh, social engagement and movement out into the world. Right, the, the increased value of peer relationships. That's beautiful, right? It certainly helps us with launching, right? At 18, 19 years old when our kids go off to college. We'll talk about college later. Um, that, uh, that's a pretty positive skill set to have, yes? It also helps socially because we get to spread the gene pool, right? Move away from the home, right? In every species, that's pretty healthy. Here's part of the dilemma. Risk-taking behavior increases as we move away from adults that we respect or trust. Make sense? Right? Us as parents. Back to community. If my son or daughter has a strong community around her, she can move away from me without cutting off from the wisdom or the reasoning skills of adults which means it is completely counterintuitive to take your 12-year-old son, son or daughter and move him into a new community. Because it perpetuates, look, how do you, you don't, at seventh or eighth grade, you no longer know the parents of your friends in any real meaningful way. But, First through sixth grade, I've been to enough soccer games and we've been to enough PTA meetings and enough birthday parties that we all know each other and we know exactly who's got the video games and who's got the Doritos. Right? We all know exactly who's showing up for their kids and how. And when somebody else tells your kid, maybe you should wear a helmet when you're skateboarding, it's a little bit more valuable than having to hear it from you for the umpteenth time. And that's what we're talking about in terms of community. Right? Okay. Uh, the other one, increased emotionality. Right, again, brain development, not because of the hormones. Now, increased emotionality, that's a beautiful thing in terms of vitality and life passion. It also happens to look a lot like moodiness and impulsivity and uh, overreactivity. I don't have any great medicine for this. It just happens to sound like every adolescent I've ever met. Uh, all right, the fourth one. Uh, creative exploration, right? As Marlon Brando or our third president, Thomas Jefferson, might say, a little rebellion, right? To challenge limits, right? Push the status quo. Um, where it starts to get a little edgy is that your 13, 14, 15-year-old is often very likely to have that identity crisis or that crisis of faith. Uh, pretty developmentally appropriate, although obviously very challenging for us as parents. Um, the way that I would consider it is this, is that you can't really stop a waterfall, and that's what we're talking about. There's a couple things that you can do with uh, 
the, the energy and the power of a waterfall, if you harness that, well, you can either make a smart bomb or you could light up a city or perhaps the future. That's our hope, right? All right. Uh, somebody said to me recently as they were walking through this particular uh, brainstorm, as Dan Siegel calls it, they said, you know, the, uh, where do I have it? Um, every structure that my brain needs to organize my reality is falling away. I thought it was pretty articulate myself. Uh, I want to try to encapsulate all of these essential things. In fact, I want to talk about um, why they're doing this, why they have to go through this in terms of kind of, if you look at it as a, development, you know, as a, as a developmental therapist, and why would our kids have to suffer this? Well, what we're talking about, again, seeking new experience, right, courage. Uh, social uh, interaction, right? the ability to reach out and connect with other human beings, our own emotionality and our own creative reasoning and limit testing, well, that's the essence of a healthy adulthood. In fact, if you look at the word adult essence, that's what we're talking about. Right? Latin isn't just for the SAT. Adolescence, adult essence what we're meaning to do, right, is to create a healthy, meaningful adulthood. So again, I love a good encapsulation, so this is the one I have. Um, I had the good fortune yesterday of being able to go out on, a, on my buddy's sailboat with a couple friends of mine. And I was reminded of a, of a teaching that really kind of uh, encapsulates the essence of this. And the story goes something like this, is that when you want to teach a man how to build a sailboat, well, you offer him a course in carpentry, a book, and probably a YouTube video, and certainly a trip to Home Depot. But when you want to teach a boy how to build a sailboat, you take him out on a sailboat, and you awaken in him a yearning for the open sea, and he will build you a boat like you have never seen. And that's what we're trying to do, because we have been chosen to be born to very strange and sometimes dark times. As the African proverb warns, our, our boys are burning down the village. Now we happen to live in a community that will not let itself be burned to the ground. And we have issues of fire, by the way, no secret. And yet, when I look around in this community and I see the wisest, most respectable and honorable people that I know. And I reached out and I invited you all to the circle tonight because I'm not an idiot. Because one of the fundamental things that is often forgotten about true initiation is that if we are to initiate our young, we have to be something that they want to become, not just have what they want to have. And so it, it compels us to ask some pretty challenging questions. What kind of man or woman am I? Do I have what it takes to bring out the best in my community of young people, in my children, right, in the future? Do I have that? Now, a lot of us don't want to look back into our adolescence and our childhood because it was simply too painful. And so we've cut off these certain aspects of ourselves. Well, you have a child or you love a child and that option becomes completely obsolete. And you are invited, sometimes forced, to look at these woundings and these parts of self that we have distanced ourselves from or buried. And you have a chance to really learn that you really can't raise the angry, frustrated, hurting, rageful, confused, adolescent, in front of you until you finally own those cut off parts of self inside of you. And now you stand as an opportunity to raise a child. But again, you have to ask those questions. 
Where is my courageous risk taker? Where is my passion itself? How many friends have I made this last year? And when was the last time I cried and shared my fears and my pain with another? That's how we show up for our kids. It's actually the only way we're going to show up for our kids. Because if they do not respect us, we have nothing to offer them. And they need a lot. Right? Adult, getting into adulthood has become a bit of a maze. Right? Historically, it was a labyrinth. Complicated, but one way. No dead ends. We got a lot of dead ends. So I'm going to ask you again. How many of you are teachers? We can do something with that. <clears throat> this community has some incredible initiatory potential. Cali Camp was one of mine. I kissed my first girl up at Cali Camp. <laughs> and I remember the moment. We have a community of strong people. Now, there's something else that I think is important to recognize. Because sometimes, out of temperament alone, our sons and our daughters will not let us initiate them. And it is a requirement, again, of the community, and well understood that it's a community responsibility. And so it becomes really important that we move toward. And we've got all kinds of an amazing potential. And when we, as the community, show up to that with a sense of ceremony and a sense of reverence, that's what holds it and allows these boys and girls to come into their own and to recognize and, and, and own their own gifts. And then they get to build the community. And that's what we're trying to do. And then we get to put our hearts and our minds together and build a future for our kids. OK. All right, I got a list. I made a list. Uh, here's my list of things that we can do. All right. Where is it? OK. Here we go. Eight things. There's not eight anymore. I think there's 11. Um, ask a question about what they're doing, reading, painting, learning, or playing. Go camping with a boy you love and his friends. Tell and listen to a story. Race a teenager whenever you can and win some and lose some. Picture yourself at 15 years old. What would you say to him or her? Say that to the next teenager that you see that you love. Hand down your old pocket knife and do it with a sense of importance honor, and ceremony. Make a new friend. Invite a young man that you love to make a map, tell a story, or learn a skill, sport, or instrument. Write a song or a play, paint, or build something together. Make or do something for someone who does not expect it. Do something that you've done a thousand times in a completely different way. Tell your children stories about their grandparents and what your child's name means and where it came from. All right, that's what I got. Thank you. Mm. <laughs>